and welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 187. Today, we have Tom McKenna and Mike Pekovich in the studio with me, and we are going to talk about milling wide, thin stock, Desert Island Dream Projects, the ethics of selling projects somebody else designed, and Tom comes packing a plethora of smooth moves. But first, I want to reach out to any of the listeners who are going to be coming to Fine Woodworking Live. Of course, we're going to be recording an episode of Shop Talk Live, live at Fine Woodworking Live 2019. And I want to ask you, the listeners, who you want to have featured on the show. Who do you want to have live on the show with us? And what would you ask them, given the chance? So send those questions into shoptalkatauten.com. Let us know that you're going to be there. And we're looking forward to seeing each and every one of you. So let's get started with the show. We just started rolling as soon as uh, everybody got in the room. So here we are with episode number 187 of Shop Talk Live. Are you rolling? Tom. What? Are you going to tell your dust collector story? Well, which one? The one I just started? The one you just started doing. I just want to make sure we were rolling on. Oh, no. I, I, um, I had this small dust collector before I upgraded to this one and a half horsepower monster. And uh, I was just telling Mike that I emptied the dust collector for like the first time after I did a bunch of milling and it wasn't a huge amount of milling, but it, it, it occurred to me pretty quickly that my other dust collector wasn't doing a darn thing because <laughs> <laughs> I never emptied it. <laughs> Maybe once in like a year and a half or something. And I ran it all the time. <laughs> it's kind of sad. Just out of it's just wasn't collecting, eh? That's awesome. So I've, I've got something on the free pile. <laughs> I don't have a dust collector, but after that endorsement. Do you want one? No. <laughs> no, I, you know, it wasn't. I think it was just I have longer runs than than um, I should have with that other one. But, it, yeah, it certainly was underpowered, especially for planing and jointing. What about that other day? What other day? Oh, you're trying to get that out of me. The, uh, it, I have, like, the ultimate smooth move, but I've missed all of these these podcasts where you had smooth moves. And so with my new dust collector, I had a, um, a Y adapter so I could go down to a, a, a 4-inch hose. But I only had one adapter for the Y, you know, for the hose. And so I was doing a bunch of um, milling, and I wanted to get a little bit of a better draw. <laughs> and I, I, I was thinking, well, you know, I don't have a blast gate, but I have this, this shirt in my, uh, my bag of rags, and I, I stuffed it in one end of the, uh, the Y. And now, now I, now this is, I, I was very Given careful his, about his it. his past experience with I dust was, collectors, this seemed very, like a good idea. I was very careful about it. I held on to the shirt and turned it on to see if, yeah, this was going to work. And it, it worked like nothing. It was pretty, it was pretty steady in there. And I did like a day, a full day of just flattening and milling and jointing and stuff. And, I was at the end where my planer doesn't have a dust shroud, of course. I shoot my, my shavings into the corner, and then I, I sweep them up. And, and with a dust collector that works, I could actually put it into the dust collector. And I was down to the last little swoosh to put into the hose. And over my left shoulder, I just heard this loud thunk. And then everything <laughs> just shut off. <laughs> and I thought... Oh, I forgot about and I turn around and I see that the shirt was gone. <laughs> and so I had to uh, you know unplug the thing and take the the impeller housing off yeah. and and retrieve my shirt. It was almost like a a walk of shame. It was kind of embarrassing. <laughs> so it worked for a little while, but I I guess I wasn't paying attention to it. It must have been kind of inching in into, right, yeah, right. into the into the motor rod. It's kind of embarrassing. Probably would have worked, probably would have worked <laughs> in your last dust collector. I wish I recorded the sound though. The sound was really what did just it. Just imagine. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's just like funk and then everything just stopped and I knew right away it was like, "Oh, that was a mistake." But I thought it was an expensive mistake, but it was actually Fairly easy to uh, to remedy. That's good. Yeah. Well, it's better your shirt and not a squirrel or something. Yeah, or a cat. Although oh. maybe not. Because if the cat were to get sucked in there, I probably wouldn't have as much, you know, cat poop in my uh, my shop. Huh. <laughs> it's gross. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Kidding. I love my cats. It went from Benny Hill to... Uh, <laughs> Monty Python. Monty Python pretty quick. <laughs> it's 
got huge fangs. No. No. I love my cats. <laughs> what? What's so funny that was like that? the most rehearsed thing that you've ever said. I love my cats. I do. I do. Well, yeah, sometimes. I still have them. <laughs> Anyhow. All right. Got any other questions for me? <laughs> That's one way to start. That. Okay. Well, because you you had been sitting on that smooth move for quite a while, I and know, then you were on, so I, I made oh did I, tell I you made I, it be a smooth move, I, and then all of a sudden you're like, I want to do technique. Well, wait, hold on, I did it again though. I, I forgot to tell you, I I was I had to joint something last week, and uh, I didn't feel like moving the jointer closer to the uh, to the dust collector, so I did the same thing. I, I stuffed the shirt in there, though this time I duct tape. Taped it around the room. <laughs> it didn't go thunk this time. It just kind of. Do we need to take a collection worked. to get you a blast gate or no, like a fern just, coat to put I, over? No, I actually finally got the adapter, but I, I I wasn't in the mood for doing that, and so I I was in the mood for <laughs> for flattening a board that I was trying to finish a project with. So don't you have the uh, the roll around Oneida though? That I do. I and do. Can't you roll it to your jointer? Well, in theory, yeah, but I have. Um, I don't cat have a, poop I don't, all over the place. No, either. no, no. It's it's not. You know, the cat the cats like the where the shavings go. So they they have one spot that they like, and it's driving me crazy. But no, I have um, I don't have a whole lot of outlets, and that's one of the things when we, oh gotcha. when we remodeled our our kitchen, I got a new electrical panel. Now I'm up to you know sufficient power, but I don't have enough outlets, and so. I struggle not only with this rectangular space with a lolly column like right in the middle of the room, but um, I have cords on the floor and mm -hmm. moving that dust collector is just, you know, it's a pain in the butt. Yeah. So I'd rather just, you know, stick a shirt in the, in, the, in the outlet or inlet in this case. I think you can buy like a little plastic cap to fit over it. I, yeah, I know. I, I can also buy a blast case. <laughs> but no, I actually what I'll, what I'll do is I want to have my table saw and my band saw are pretty much hooked up all the time because those are the tools I use the most. And mm. when I do jointing, I can just disconnect the band saw hose and stick it on the jointer because they're pretty much right next to each other. I didn't realize I, um, I have a piece of cardboard just leaning in front of the bottom part of my jointer. Um, cause I don't have a good place to put it, and big pieces of cardboard, it turns out, are really nice to have lying around. Yeah, to, definitely. To lay down for glue ups. Yep. And the other day, I look behind the piece of cardboard, and I have just jointer shavings all because they just <laughs> fall right yeah. out and just start piling up. And it, I, I thought something was making a nest back there, and but no, it just turned out it was just, just time chips. to just break you. out the vacuum. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I used to, <clears throat> I used to keep a cardboard box near my planer. Um, to try to catch the the shavings, but uh, it, the stuff always went everywhere. It never landed in the box. I still had to do a bunch of sweeping. But I tell you now, with the with a dust collector, it's pretty. It's so quick to be able to like sweep up and actually suck in the the pieces. It's kind of kind of nice. Fun. A good luxury to have, I guess. All right, let's answer some questions. All right. First one is from Paul, and. Uh, Let's see. Heide Martin serving trays in the May-June 2018 issue are beautiful, and I've since made a couple. My question is about keeping the bottom boards flat. I cut some walnut that had been air-dried for probably 20 years. In an hour or two, both boards cupped. I then sequentially dried wetting, just sequentially tried wetting one side, wetting both sides, soaking in water, soaking in fabric softener, each time clamping the boards to keep them flat and leaving them for days and days to dry out. None of these things worked, and in the end, I ended up using some walnut plywood instead. How do you folks keep wide, thin boards flat? Well, my first question is, what's with the fabric softener? I was gonna, is, that a, I, is that a tip that I don't know smell, about? It's the only way to make walnut smell good. I think it's a, like a veneer flattening trick. Is it? Oh, okay. I didn't, I I didn't know heard of it. They have some chemicals you can spray on, like, curly veneer mm -hmm. and then you know you sort of clamp it down oh, okay. with layers of i think newspaper or something on top and bottom yeah there's really a flat there's a bvd yeah bob van dyke cool for those who don't oh, work in i that. just learned something i thought it was some sort of a typo or a joke but um i mean it sounds like when you re-saw this um 
I'm guessing you just there were some built up tensions in the board, and when you resaw it, they they probably cupped fairly immediately after you resaw them. And I think when that happens, they ain't going to get back to flat. Yeah, because you've sort of changed that kind of stress equilibrium in the board to where now it just wants to be a potato chip. So, um, you know, this is tough. It, it's a tough thing trying to get really thin stock. Um, Probably on something like that. How thick is that bottom? Like a quarter inch or something? Um, man, I looked I up all the other dimensions. I didn't go and look it up either. <laughs> it's 12 and a quarter by 21 inches. Okay. I did not look up the other one. I'll, I think I'll it's pretty right thin. So let's say it's yeah. like a quarter to three-eighths of an yeah. inch. Um, you know, if you're starting with four-quarter stock, and and also this is pretty wide. Um, I don't know. I might um, just sort of rip the board in half. So now I've got two pieces, um, mm -hmm. say half width, rip both of those. Yeah. They're going to cop. You kind of let them do their thing. You flatten them a little bit, leave them over thickness. They're probably going to cut some more. You flatten yeah. them again, take them down to final thickness, yeah. glue them back together. Um, and I think if you go through that process to the point where it's flat and it wants to stay flat, you know, once once you're done, yes, with seasonal humidity changes, it will want to cup one way or the other in the future. But I think the key is once it's flat and you can get the whole thing glued up and sort of captured mm -hmm. in the frame or if it's a tabletop, you know, secured down to a base or if it's a door panel, it's locked into the door frame. Um, that's the whole idea is you kind of want to start flat and then lock it down somehow to where it's going to stay flat. But starting cupped is really, really tough. That is tough. So um, I think you probably were maybe a little too optimistic when you were resawing your stock, thinking you could, you know, do a thin resaw and it's going to stay flat on you, and it didn't. And once it didn't, um, you either keep going skinnier or, unfortunately, we probably want to try again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny for this answer. I had this recollection of us doing a, a Q&A years ago, um, Answered by Chris Bexford about placing a board, you know, out in the sun, convex, uh, yeah. convex side out and whatever. Yeah. Um, and I finally found it. Uh, I didn't actually remember that Chris was the the um, the person who answered it. But the, was that the one where you put it on the lawn? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a great photo of of sun shining down on the board, and that's what it's, I had in my head. And I'm doing all these weird search terms, sunlight and blah blah blah. Anyway, <laughs> um, I finally found the article, and Chris had a really good point that. Um, that I that I was considering was the fact that he mentions when you're milling stuff, take it slow and take it light. So it could have been that, you know, it could have helped by taking a you know some smaller passes or letting things yeah. settle when you start milling this. But I don't know. It's, yeah, keep it as thick as long as possible yeah. and kind of keep taking yeah. it down. It's it's yeah. hard to keep thin boards flat. And sometimes I remember in the um, the fine woodworking shop, it was hard to keep even three quarter inch yeah. stock flat. Um, I had done a tabletop years ago, and I <clears throat> cut the breadboard ends, uh, the tenons on the ends of the, the top, and I left for the weekend, and I, I was just kind of in a rush, and I didn't want to um, spend time fitting the breadboard and so on, on a Friday afternoon, so I left it till Monday, and I came back in, and, and the whole tabletop, it was like five and a half six feet long maybe just was you know completely twisted i mean like severely wow. like i looked at yeah. it when i walked into the shop and i was like oh my god you know <laughs> yeah. i was able to to work it to a point where i you know got it flattened but i, I had to remove a lot of material and i think i actually had to recut it hmm. um that was your maple table yeah cool yeah and it was it was a nightmare and yeah. then but I, what i had to do to get the the breadboard ends on was clamp the yeah. tabletop down to clamp the, it flat get yeah. that sucker on there yeah, yeah. I, was, I did it on the uh the table saw uh yeah. top is it, is it still flat yeah yeah i mean i couldn't get it perfect you know once it i couldn't keep removing material you know yeah. right and, yeah. and i had to kind of settle in but you know it was it was a challenge getting those breadboard ends on and it's you know it's secure to the to the base but one of the things i i was going to say was when you're doing anything like this, like the final milling, try to get the thing together or get the joinery right. cut like right away if yeah. you can, because um, in, a, in an environment, at least at the, the old shop where it's super dry, things just change quickly. My, I don't have that issue at my house. It's, I think I seem to be pretty level. I actually did that one time. Um, I had a desktop that 
warped on me in the old shop. I put it outside uh, on the front lawn on a dewy day, mm-hmm. a dewy front lawn. So the uh, the con concave side, is side down, down. <clears throat> right? Yeah. So the bump is up. Yeah, yeah. bump is up. Yeah. Went into work. Um, I was probably into work for an hour and a half, two hours. And I remember I had a meeting with you. And <laughs> this is the only place where you could pull this off. I said, Tom, can I blow off this meeting? Because I got to go flip my board <laughs> down at the shop. It's on the lawn. And you were like, oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> but I went down and, and it was potato chip the other way. Yeah. I had left yeah. it too long. So do yeah. not like do that Little, and yeah. just leave it outside. Right. Yeah. So the next day I did it the opposite way. I think eventually I got it flat. Um, and eventually... I was able to get everything together, clamped, and I. Every time I was working on this desk, before I left for the end of the day, I cl- I spent ten minutes clamping it back up yeah. in, in the positions every all the pieces were going to go, until one day I didn't, and I left it for about a week, and I came back, and it it like those boards just wanted to potato chip. Yeah, yeah. And there was, at that point, I think that I had. I had muscled them in every direction too many times and it just wasn't going to go back and I had to give up on one of them. Uh, the bottom board is, is actually in, you know, in place right now on top of the unfinished desk space in my dining room um, and flat enough. But the potato the, or the lawn thing does work, but yeah. I would just do it on a day where you are home and well, not... Yeah, yeah. In you, your and you don't even you don't even need to do it on the lawn. I've done it in my basement. If I have a uh, like a shallow cup that's developed mm-hmm. in a piece, I've wetted the the concave side yeah. and you know left it that way. Yeah. and it and it works. I still have to do a little bit of reflattening, but typically, if I'm not going to be diving into something that I've just tried to flatten, I've I either sticker it or if it's thin stuff. Um, I have the, the the good thing about having my my shop in my basement is my weights or my free weights are like right there, and I'll put a board on top and put like twenty pounds of yeah. weight on mm-hmm. it just to right. just hold it in place steady. So that that helps too. Cool. Uh, Heido's uh, piece is twenty or twenty one inches long, twelve and a quarter wide, a quarter inch thick. Yeah, really yeah. thick. You know. Um, I don't remember that if the edges are rabbit fitted groove or if it's completely housed, but you it know, is yeah. like a breadboard. I mean, if you, you wanted to use to. quarter inch ply, you know, that's not gonna. It looks like you can in, you can sort of adapt that really easily for a quarter inch ply if you wanted to get away from that, mm-hmm. um, or just kind of work it. So on something like that, yeah, I would probably glue it up in halves if it's that. You know, doing my flattening with six inch ish boards and then sort of glue them together, then maybe run them together once they're glued up through the planer or just scrape them flat or something mm-hmm. like that. But um, yeah, and if it starts out basically flat, even if it wants to move, that's so thin that you should be able to, have, you Flex know, it. once it's, yeah, once yeah. it's glued in place, it shouldn't stress the thing out of uh, flat. Awesome. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Question number two. I love these questions. In reality, from Richard, in reality, we all have limited a limited amount of shop time available. However, if the amount of time you could work on a project was not limited, what one piece would you make? You like these questions? I love these oh, questions. Man. Well, what's, what's your answer? <laughs> That's, you've got one. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I'm going to steal a thunder, though. I'm going to go all Pekovich. Yeah. The piece I'm working on right now. That is pretty good. <laughs> um, I so I finally um, have. I'm dipping my toe in the waters of Luthery, and I'm making a ukulele. And uh, I can't. I don't know his name. This has become cliche now. Gang Green on Instagram like was the one who pushed me off the ledge. He sent me a message one day. He was like, dude, just do it. Wasn't Tiny Tim? Oh, ben, that, ben, no. Ben, 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 Tiny Tim is, wow. right? I, 
<laughs> oh, oh, tip-toe oh, tip through, through the, the yeah. Okay, I was thinking, that, yeah. All right, all right. Oh. Generational gap. <laughs> eh. It's a taste in music gap. Oh, it's. Oh. <laughs> hey, I don't have Tiny Tim on my uh, playlist. Okay, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so I've always, always, always wanted to own a really nice archtop guitar. So I figure, let's face it, I'm never going to be able to afford a $6,000 guitar. So the only way I'm going to get one is to make one. The only way I'm going to make an archtop guitar worth playing yeah. is by making other ones not worth yes. playing. The most cost-effective way of doing that is to scale it down to a ukulele. Oh, interesting. It's a baritone ukulele. Okay, because um, the skills transfer for the most part. I would... I, well, we're going to find out let's eventually. Say yes. Yeah. Um, so, a baritone ukulele, which for, is the greatest instrument of all time, just getting that out there, baritone ukulele fans. Whatever. Hmm. Um, Crickets. <laughs> it's, it's the most pleasing instrument to play. You keep saying you're going to bring it in. I keep saying I'm going to. I have two. I'll bring. I'll, I'll bring one in for you to borrow. I need to change the strings on both right. of my ukes, and. The so problem it, with uke strings is it takes like two weeks for them to settle in. So he's got the, you the, really the lingo, the uke. That's yeah. awesome. first name That's basis awesome. with the uke. Hey, you should bring it to live. <laughs> Get no. up there and uh, play with Tequila Tim. Not oh. Tiny Tim, Tequila Tim. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, because we have live music. Yeah. So you were saying, I know the ukulele. My daughter had a ukulele, um, and that tuning is different than a regular guitar, but you were saying the baritone ukulele, it's got four strings, but they're in There's the no same There's no weird octave jump. tuning. So are they the skinniest strings or the fattest strings? The skinniest strings. I guess that's a good way of saying it. Okay. That. So I always played like the opposite of the baritone ukulele, which on my electric guitar... I was a bit ham-fisted, and the bottom two strings would often break, so I'm always playing the top four strings. So I had to learn leads using just the top four strings. <laughs> so, the, I love it when we talk about music because everything you say about music is the opposite of how you would work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I used to just break my guitar strings all the time, so I just figured out how to play around them. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Precise Woodworker. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Instagram, I watched these. I guess we're not even speaking of Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but there's Did a, you welcome that? to spending time with Mike. There are a lot of guitar players on Instagram who are really accomplished, doing wonderful, wonderful stuff. And if Instagram had existed when I chose to pick up the guitar, I never would have because I've never come within light years of what. Every single person on Instagram is just sort of doing on guitar. So hats off to all you guys. You guys are awesome. I'm glad I didn't know I wasn't that awesome. Or I never, would have done it. <laughs> never listened to records before in my life. I can never play guitar. I could bang them, though. I was good at smashing them. Don't. Do, well, some guitars are worth smashing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that, all right. Wow, we really got that one. Good Way start. off course. Very um, ukulele. Can we move on well, to the next so question? Well, so that's my current <laughs> one, but if, if it was like one project for the rest of your life. Yeah. Ah, uh, but see, here's the rub, because I would, I want to play the guitar. Mm. I don't want to spend the rest of my life building the guitar. Yeah. Because I want to enjoy the fruits of my labor. Well, how long do you have? Right. This is I, the thing. W that, you I, never know. That's the problem. Well, that's my problem with so, the question. Like, I can't. I, I just don't have this like one thing that there's I, not. Oh, there's not a know. single project. You always like talk about had, like Dan Faye's Bombay chest. You yeah, would want to do that I would one day. Never want to do that. Hell no. I saw him. Make Hell it. no. <laughs> I saw him. Make <laughs> <that thing. laughs> Man, he was. You know, it, he did that all pretty much by hand. You know, sculpting those <laughs> those sides out of the uh, the walnut uh, mahogany slabs and the uh, no, I, I just and I don't. You know, it's not my taste either. I mean, if I, if I were going to build a big project, I'd rather do Garrett Hack's sideboard or hunt board. board. Yeah. But I, you know, when I build stuff, I'm typically building things that I need or want in my house or as a gift for someone. So I don't have, I guess I don't have like this dream piece. I know that sounds kind of weird. I, the, the, although 
there is one thing that I that I do plan to make is, and I've never done a chair, and I'm I'm planning to build some stools for my for my kitchen um, counter. What um, style? Like the Peter Galbert one? I don't know yet. Or the, no, the Bexford no. style. I don't know. Mm-hmm. No, I'm, I'm thinking. Um, He's thinking legs. I'm seat? thinking something you like know. the Gary Rogowski style. Something uh, probably something <laughs> not definitely something not turned. Yeah, you know it. Um, but I haven't. Yeah, I've been drawing things here and there, and I kind of always come back to um, something similar to the Rogowski, but yeah. it's not flared, and I don't know. But anyway, that's not – so that's sort of that. I, I What I had to think about the question, I couldn't get my head around it because I was like, well, if you had like a month to live, what are you going to build? And I probably wouldn't build anything. I'd I'm not sure outside. I'm going to spend that time in the shop, you know? yeah, so, honestly. So, but, but, I, but I started thinking, all right, you know, I'm, I'm a person that doesn't have a whole lot of time, you know, when winter's not around to, to spend in the shop. And But I was thinking, well, it would be nice to have seven days. What if I had seven days, you know, basically eight to ten hours a day? And... I realized the thing that I would do, and it's 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 kind of boring, but I would build like tool holders and tables for my shop. Like I really oh, need better like shop storage, but I can't I can't seem to find the time to do it because I don't really want to do it because I'd rather make something that I want to use or or something that's more kind of fun yeah. so make a more functional shop so that right. when you go out there it's I, more i would spend the whole week you know because i never really when i when i moved into the shop i did it and i wouldn't recommend this to people i did it kind of piecemeal i did a little bit at a time and i think i would have been better off just saying all right i'm committing to this space and i'm i'm going to put up walls i'm going to do this before i move in anything um you know, in hindsight, I, I probably should have done that. So now I'm sort of like constantly moving things and readjusting. So I never got to that build a shop first concept. It was sort of like I moved in and I've been kind of building around what I have. Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of how I thought about the question. So if I had seven days, what I could do in seven days would be pretty amazing, I think. Mike? Um, actually, I would probably rephrase this question too. If you had, <laughs> if you had unlimited space in your house for furniture, what would you that, make? That's another thing. Yeah. That that's probably like the biggest challenge for me. Um, I don't know. This is kind of a non-answer as well. Um, one thing, I mean, sort of related to the fact that I don't have a lot of space in my house for anything new, although I keep trying to cram stuff in there. Um, I. I realized that sort of having a house full of stuff kind of limited me design-wise just to like individual pieces of furniture. And I think really what I've sort of started doing a little bit when I'm sketching on the side is thinking in terms of entire rooms, like doing interior design, you know, where you're incorporating built-ins with uh, freestanding furniture and stuff. So green and green type. type green and green, right. Frank Lloyd Wright, um, where you really have control over the entire space. I think oh, that's, man. that's really cool. Because I, I think for me where that I, that just started to bridge that gap was uh, we have a little alcove at the top of our stairs where it's always usually cluttered with stuff. and <clears throat> Wall cabinets to take pictures of. <laughs> well, yes, that, that is in my little <laughs> photo studio. Um, so I put a little drop front desk in there. And then above it, I hung a little wall cabinet. Go figure. <laughs> um, and then I, I'd made a little Jenny Alexander ladder back chair way, way back. And I stuck that up there for a photo. So it was just sort of like desk is just a piece of furniture. Wall cabinet is just a piece of furniture. Chair is a chair. Okay. But when you put all three together in a small space next to a window with raking light and what I realized is just by putting objects in the space, you're actually kind of defining that space, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. You're transforming that space into something that didn't exist before those things were there. And it was that notion of, I mean, as furniture makers, we're really focused on making individual objects, but that notion of how those objects interact with the space that they're in to help to transform that space, um, that to me is like a really, really cool thing. And, and as much as I think it's really, really cool, honestly, in terms of time-wise and stuff, um, I don't consider that as much as I would like to. I'm really, 
you know, just fighting to get the time to be in my shop to make a piece of furniture. So I think if I had more time, I would want to think maybe a little bit more holistically instead of doing one piece at a time, doing a collection of pieces at a time, maybe in, in terms of creating a space um, from the use of multiple objects, whether it's built in, whether it's wall pieces, whether it's freestanding. Um, that would be really cool. I think that's that right, would so, be my next step. So Jeannie comes down. Bling, blum, blum, boom. You have this wish or whatever. Um, that This wish that has to be woodworking based. Um, I was just about to He confused me. I was sorry. I was just about to ask, who's Genie? <laughs> <laughs> but um, would you do a gamble house kind of? Uh, like take it, extend yeah. that interior all the way to the exterior? Was yeah, sure. Because... Japanese joinery in terms of architecture, bam. Like the those awesome tea houses and the thought and the care that goes into those, so that kind of timber frame style yeah. structure and the interior space is created. But yeah, I mean, obviously, I think, yeah, I mean, the, the holy grail is you start with a piece of land, you design a house, you design each room, you fill each room. Um, yeah, I think that would be, that's it, that's the holy grail. That would be my project for the rest of my life. Okay. Yeah, because be yeah. really cool. you try try applying, you know, you woodworking ideas to carpentry, and it takes a long time to remodel things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. think that yeah. way. There's this really beautiful um, house in Southern California way back. Um, it was actually pictured in one of my favorite books, but I was talking to the people who worked on it, and it was a contemporary arts and crafts house, but in the green and green style where everything was built and everything was was outfitted with furniture and, and interior stuff as a whole. And the person just said kind of offhand, it's a really good thing this person was a drug dealer because nobody else could afford to have this done. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oh, employment, okay. Employment tip. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so, um, and it, yes. All that, right. That's not in my future either. So this house probably is not in my future. Well, it's nice to dream but yeah. see that's we we actually came to answers for everyone and everyone said like mm. I, I didn't i didn't say i that. can't answer this mm. <laughs> ben, ben's getting all uppity on a monday uh, <laughs> all right it's time for, are, are we gonna do techniques all-time favorite technique of all time yeah for this week yeah yeah who wants to go pocket hole jig bam and you know what you have some gall <laughs> Post in pocket hole like ode to the pocket hole jig on Instagram after you've been in here and be like, Oh, you can't use pocket holes on anything. Very Mike. nicely photographed pocket hole jig, yeah, breaking light, yeah. workbench. I, person, yes. I, I don't think it's I've ever like your job or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Mike has ever said never pocket holes. No. Uh somebody with has more time he? than I needs to go back to the no, I've never, ever said never the, anything. There are places for it, for sure. Yeah. And in this particular place, okay, it wasn't a finished piece of furniture. I'm mocking up um, a case on stand. And so I'm building the base, and I wanted a way to join all of the parts. I've done it with just screws from the outside of the parts to the inside. That's kind of tough. I didn't want to do that. didn't want to do dominoes. That's too much work. Traditional mortise and tenon joining in a mock-up wasn't going to happen. Um, so, but the... The pocket screws worked really, really well. They're attached from the inside, so you don't see it from the exterior. They're also really cool because it lets you take the parts out really quickly for reshaping, sawing down, changing the dimensions. You just cut a half inch off, and you just screw it back on in place if you need to move it up or down. Yeah, it's awesome. So basically, I, I designed and redesigned this base Subtly, probably I made four or five rounds of small changes in a morning. So like in two hours, I did so much design, um, much to the um, pocket hole screws. It just made it really fast and easy intuitive. Like you weren't invested. Oh, man, but I just cut that mortise and tenon joint. It's good. I'm going to leave it there. No. Mm -hmm. Zip. Move it. Zip back in. And it, it doesn't look like, you know. 
foam core mock up and yeah. it doesn't look like you know pink insulation to make the yeah you were using wood real wood really yeah using pine in, instead of um the the final wood but you know i did a good job milling it um there the legs had some shaping i took some time shaping the legs so that's a problem you want mock-ups to be really really fast but at the same time you need to be able to envision what you're making from yeah. them. It can't be too big of a leap. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this this helped quite a bit. Pine is great for mock-ups. I'm I'm making this little wall shelf, and I have these funky beveled under bevels underneath that I had in my in my head, but I couldn't really draw them. And I started just doing mock-ups. I had the sketch of what I wanted dimension-wise, and I just took this pine board and started playing. And then once I had it right. It was like my template. I was able to actually draw on it yeah. and label where parts were and things like that. So I love pine. Yeah, I've, I didn't I've, use pocket holes, though. I've done that where you actually take the the mock-up leg and that's your round yeah. template. Yeah, you know, it, it becomes it, a story yeah. stick. It's cool. Yeah. And the best part is you, you actually happen to have some esoteric pocket hole jig, too. <laughs> is that esoteric? Which one do you have? Know. It was Isn't a CMT. It? Old CMT. I was, oh, I was like, that's screwed down to a piece of plywood. <laughs> it's like the hipster pocket hole jig. Guess so. <laughs> it's vintage. Yeah. Did it predate the uh, the Craig jig? Don't know. Probably. It looked well. Whatever. All right. It you works. Go next. Me? Yeah. Oh, um, sure. I I have well, I sort of have two, but. Um, I don't want to hold them like I had to hold the, uh, right. the other thing. So one was, uh, <clears throat> I just mentioned this project I'm making, and, and it's part of it is it, the wall shelf is going to be a key holder, and it's really basic. But um, the the workpiece that has the key holder dowels or whatever, I'm putting a, a wide chamfer on it, and it's one board. It's It was highly figured tiger maple, and I was sitting there trying to figure out well, how, you know, what's the best way to do this? I can, you know, I've got a, a left tilting, I'm sorry, right tilting table saw, which makes cutting bevels, you know, or chamfers kind of a little more difficult. Yeah. Could have done it on my band, so then done handwork. And then I remembered all these things that I've learned from going on photo shoots. And I remember the first time I learned this from Garrett, where he did this article on um, creating tabletop edges. And he had this really cool method of, cutting a bevel by hand and basically he scribed you know a line along the top like yep. he had a vision of what how wide that that bevel or chamfer was going to be and he scribed a line along the top edge and then along the side and then just hand planed to the line and i was like boy i only have one piece i'm gonna have to hand work anyway so, right. so yeah. fun <laughs> yeah it really and i had this really i've got i'm so loving my my bevel up high angle smoothing plane i i I can't gush enough about it, you know, and finally having done that, you know, resharpening to get a higher angle. But I had this thing and it was like 10, 15 minutes worth of work and probably less than that, probably less than 10 minutes. And I was like right on my line and I was able to kind of pick it up and eyeball it. Whereas sometimes with machines, you make that cut and it's like, ah, oh, just a little too far. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so it was cool. And I, I was so happy that I was able to use again something that I learned just being on the road here. Um, the other thing is um, for the, the key holders, I, I didn't want to just stick in dowels and have them kind of hanging out because I've got this beautiful wood and I'm using walnut dowels. So I kind of was playing with these copper tacks, by tacking them into the end of the dowel and doing different things. And yeah, I was like, what that's was kinda, that? Well, I was just trying to get something. I didn't want that just black hole staring at me from underneath the... the the, the shelf top so I wanted to add a little bit of sparkle to the walnut and so I I had these copper tacks and I you know I was countersinking the at the end trying to see what it would look like inlaid or whatever um, but the hard part about that was getting the um, getting the hole centered you know, like getting that tack centered on this three eight inch dowel yeah. and, I, and I'm like how am I gonna do this I can do it with one but how am I gonna do it with you know five of these things and so I experimented and, and ultimately what I did is I just kind of eyeballed the center point and I have an Amana really great it's a tapered um, countersink bit set but what's cool about it, it has a really fine point like probably one of the finest mm. drill pit points that I've got available and so once I had one centered I basically had a, I drilled a, a three-inch hole in a 
in a block and stuck the dowel in there. And then all I did was align the drill press fence with the, you know, correctly with the block and then align the drill bit tip with the perfectly centered hole that I had in the dowel that I did by eye and then just clamp everything in place. And then all I had to do was just kind of take the, the dowel out, put a new one in the hole and then just kind of oh, that's really cool. tap it yeah. down. And I wasn't going, all I really need, needed was a dimple because I wanted the tacks to yeah, have yeah. some, some catch. Yeah. But I was kind of like, wow, I figured something out. Yeah. And I don't remember. It's funny. I remember we used to get all these questions about how do you cut a dowel in half or how do you find the center of this and that? And I'm like, you know, I don't think I ever answered any of those questions or figured if we talked about those at all. But sometimes I guess it does come into play. Yeah, the, the answer is, why do you want to do that? Yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. That was, that was always the answer. And then I was like, well, now I have a reason that I have to find the center. And yeah. and I couldn't come up with a perfect way to actually find center. I really was was doing it by eye, and I did make a few errors. But, yeah. you know, it was just – but that's kind of what's fun about just being in the shop. I mean, I'm just like, <laughs> I know it sounds really stupid when I, if I were to talk about this with, at a, you know, some dinner party or whatever, people would be like, yeah. so what's on TV? Yes. <laughs> you know? yeah. But I've got a bunch of dowels and I'm like, all right, how am I going to put yeah. these things in the center? Well, what especially a three eighths inch dowel. Cause even if you did have like a center finding thingamajig, it's, the, it's the hard. The pencil <laughs> line is going to be too thick. Probably. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's, it's a three eighths inch that's a hard scale to do it at. Yeah, I wound up when I first started doing. I tried doing an X mark, and then uh, once the first line was off, you know, all bets mm -hmm. were off. And right. so I finally, I was just like, you know, I'm gonna have to drill. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to do it. Yeah. And once I found it, it became. Then I was like, well, how do I repeat that? Yeah, and that's I, cool. I had to spend a few minutes trying to figure out how do I get this thing set up correctly yeah i was trying to like while you were talking i'm thinking how do you do that how do you do that how, how do you do that and when you said you drill a three eighth inch hole that you can stick the dowel into then it's like oh bam you just put that thing over it you know you kind of shove it part way through the hole then you just bring a center punch in from the other side and that registers oh. that bam right there oh dang but the key is getting in the hole yeah. that's like that's genius that's great <laughs> but that would only work. You couldn't do yeah. a center punch if you're just right. trying to manually line it like yeah. anything else. So, but I almost cool. had another smooth move, Ben. You would have liked it. Yeah. I, I almost, I have a foot paddle switch on my drill press. Oh. It, and sometimes it's, I love it. It sounds uh, dangerous. It though. sounds, it, well, it can be if you leave the key in the chuck. For I, took, <laughs> I, I remember. I've been on a run of that, by the way. I, I the almost key in the chuck? Yeah, yeah. Really? I almost did it again, but I saw it. I was like, oh, take that out. Huh. So, but the paddle switch is tough. If you leave the switch engaged on the on the motor head, um, if you step on the thing, it scares the holy bejesus out of you. It also scares the cat. <laughs> the cat stepped on the pedal once, and he just he flew. I swear, he jumped like four feet in the air and took off. Like, and I didn't see him for the rest of the day. <laughs> anyway, I've, I love I, my cat. <laughs> I've always had like a deep fear of the the Chucky in the drill press. Mm, and yeah. then all of a sudden I, I think maybe in the past month I've done it two or three times. Really? What? Yeah. Just, and it's not like it's not the end of the world. Well mine really is tethered isn't. to the um to the drill. To I the think drill that's press. worse. So it doesn't yeah, I get well, a big it, old it, heavy it, chain. It pops out. Yeah, it pops out. Like it, I, I the other way it can kind of shoot at you. But it doesn't shoot at you with any real force. <laughs> <laughs> I realize how stupid that sounded. <laughs> it's it's it, not it it's, only hurts it's, a little it's bit. not like a you know a kickback projectile. Oh speed. no, no. It's, it's a, it just comes flying out and I don't, I don't know. know. It's weird. Has, Maybe the, the fact question is if anyone out there has been hit in the face by one and if it was like damaging. Leave a comment. Huh. I wonder. I don't know. They've hit in the face because that's that's got to be fairly low probability, right? It's got to be because it can like fling out in any, yeah, at any degree. So you think there's only a five degree right. red there, zone it there, would right? Have to, it would have to spin out. And maybe we need some engineers here. You know, I, I like want to start like a question. woodworking Mythbusters. <laughs> we could, huh. yeah. Is That'd it really going to like fling out with that much force? No, I don't. It, I mean, it doesn't. It, it, sounds it comes bad. flying out and it's scary. But it's like it's, crap. What's that? It's yeah. it's like it's kind of like you know. Huh. Dropped. Did yeah. you ever leave like your 
table saw arbor nut wrenches in place accidentally? Oh my God, I've never no. Done that. Well, why are you leaving your chuck key in your drill press? It's kind of the same thing. It, it sort of is. No, it's not. It is. It's, no, it's it's that was one of the dumber it's things. It's kind of the same. It's, I think it's I, I leave a of, pair I mean, of wrenches on my router. My router call it after changing the bit accidentally, and no, those wrenches it's, it's go different, flying though. off. You know, with the table saw, you put the you're putting the plate back on the yeah. insert, so yeah. it's that that wrench is going to be in the way. You're not, I, yeah, and you're not doing it like you know ten times a day. Hmm. Yeah, it's I, I know that's a really good point. It's just careless. <laughs> Because it's in your hand. The the key is in your hand. You tighten it. It's still in your hand. It's not like you ever let go and the key is still in the drill press. Obviously, some of us Apparently. have this issue. Wow. We like to keep the key in the ignition. I don't know. Huh. It's kind of weird. I guess so. This is a smooth move, right? No, we're still on favorite techniques. This oh. episode's all over the place. Who's, okay. who's, you're up, right, Ben? Mine's really lame because I thought we were doing a smooth move, but so I just went to my list because oh. I keep a list so yeah. I can shoot from the hip. I thought we were doing smooth move too, but I was still going to say pocket screws. So, <laughs> <laughs> winner, winner, chicken dinner. Um, <laughs> mine is uh, the Michael Fortune technique of pivoting off the back of the blade Isn't that cool? on the bandsaw. And it never made sense to me no. until it uh, finally made it. sense yes. to me. <laughs> I, I was on a, um, I, I was, I edited that article and I remember I was like, what are you talking about? It's like that, when he was telling me, you know, when I was working on the edit, I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about here. Yeah. And he's like, oh, you'll get it. You'll get it when, when you're here. And then, you know, I often will, will try things when I was on photo shoots and I tried it and I was like, oh my gosh, he's right. This is like working like a dream well especially for starting a cut yeah like you're doing a little taper and you, you need to start it in the middle of a of, of an edge and i've been uh, with this ukulele build i've been making so many templates my shop is just covered in particle board pieces right now but and as part of that just I've been doing a lot of cutting to the line so that and trying to get close to the line so I'm not yeah. routing all of this crap away. Right. And um and so I've really been getting good at cutting curves on the bandsaw. Yeah. And it's like once you really get that technique down and I mean how should, how should we try and explain this to a listener a little bit better? How wide but of a blade are you using? I'm actually right now in love with my three sixteenths inch blade. Three sixteenths. It's I know. And you, it was the sharp blade I had on but, hand. But you can ride the back edge of a three sixteenths blade. Going into a cut, yes. Huh. Yeah. yeah, that's tough. I think you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I use, I've used it with a three eighths inch blade. I've never used it with anything. Maybe a quarter. I love inch. this three sixteenths inch blade. Cool. By the way, it's that's. And the argument might just be, it was the only sharp blade yeah. I had, so it's great. But this is this blade has been performing. No, that's really cool. I was going to say, since I get went to a bigger bandsaw, I always have a half inch blade in the bandsaw, and having that wider blade helps me pivot off that yeah. back edge of the blade because you can't pivot off the teeth because yeah. it's just going to cut. But as you're cutting, so as you're cutting straight, and if the rear of the blade is just centered in your curve, there's no bearing point mm -hmm. at all. But if you, so if you kind of rotate the stock just a little bit, so that one side of the curve is against the rear of the blade as you're making the cut, you have a pivot point yeah. to kind of steer, and you're yeah. finding you can do that with a three sixteen well, blade okay, too. Okay, so no, this isn't in the cut. Uh, okay, this is rotating to start the cut. Rotating off. Oh, so oh, like, it's like a starting pin. Yeah, so, but you're not yeah. on the end of the board. You're on the side of a board. Yeah, beginning a in, tape in or going the middle from zero. Of an edge. Yes. Oh. Yes. So yeah, oh. your yours. If if you've got a three eighths inch half inch blade, whatever, you absolutely have more blade there to pivot off yeah. of. But still, if you're starting that that little edge. That yeah, no, I get it. In from the middle of an zero edge, to nothing. From zero to nothing. You hit, the, you 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 put that piece on the back of the blade yeah. and rotate into it. 
and you get you can start it exactly where you want. That yeah. blade isn't drifting at exactly. all. Exactly. You're trying to nail it and yeah. getting all squirrely and it's bending away from the stock. Exactly. And, it's yeah. stuck in place. Yeah. You start your cut, then you just roll. I'm with you know? it. I've never thought in those terms. Now I am. There yeah. Go. Yeah, that technique is amazing. Once you it, it takes some practice, but even when you first start doing it, even if you're still a little bit off your line, farther off your line than you want to be, you're not going to end up with those wavy cuts that yeah. are always so difficult to smooth and yeah. get uniform from from board to board. Yeah. So. All right. right That's awesome technique. Thank you. Yeah. Wow, we we ran the gamut of your reactions to my technique then. Yeah, and you the brought gamut. me full circle. <laughs> I'm down. All right, we're going to take a break. Joe Taylor from Rikon. Yes. I'm a woodworker. Do I need a backpack? You absolutely do need a backpack. The reason why is all of us woodworkers are always using pails or buckets or tool wraps to try and carry all of our tools around. And Rikon is so excited to introduce our heavy duty woodworkers backpack. It's made out of ballistic nylon. We have multiple tool compartments, internal loops. There's a total of 24 storage pockets with 10 loops holders. It's lightweight. You could use it as a backpack for traveling or just use it around your shop to keep all your hand tools or even power tools just in one spot. Yeah, but I have an image to uphold. Am I going to look good? You're not only going to look good, you're going to feel good because it's a great product. It's got great balance. It's comfortable. It's awesome. All right. Question number three is from Mark. I have been building furniture full time for just over a year. Is it legal and or ethical to make something from the magazine or a video workshop and then sell it? For instance, if a client asks me to build four Adirondack chairs, my thought is to build them loosely based on what I find in fine woodworking versus reinventing the wheel with my own design every time. It's a great question. There's some gray areas, but Tom, I want you to go first from like the official magazine standpoint, because I never quite know what it is. Contact our lawyer. Uh, <laughs> well, here's the thing. We have, um, we've gotten this question. Usually people will write in um, or call in with this question and, and Betsy has this answer. It's kind of a canned answer that Screw we Screw you! Well, How that's dare really you not build what a Betsy project from our magazine. Um, <laughs> the, the bottom line, you know, and unfortunately, Betsy, she's like my, my guide pole yeah. <laughs> here, and she's not in today, and I was trying to find that letter, so yeah. it's like the official yeah, it, there's, position. There, there is an official page. Um, basically, it, 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 it's sort of, it's, you know, you can kind of do whatever you want, because we are printing the plans, but it is an unethical thing to do to um, make a, a line of furniture for sale using another person's design, you know, without, so what we basically tell people is, you know, you can build as many for your family and friends, um, for yourself, but when it comes to profiting off of the work, yeah, we direct people to the maker who owns the design. You know, we own the copyright to the physical plan, you know, that if we sell them, um, but we also pay royalties to people that we yeah. sell plans uh, for. So we don't want people to basically go and, you know, see something like a chest of drawers by Chris Bexford and say, oh, I can make that. I'm going to go and sell that and make a living off of what Chris, you know, labored to design. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, for me, there is a gray area. And that the, the answer for me is usually it's for... Um, for personal use, but that intellectual property still is owned exactly. by the author yeah, exactly. itself. Yeah. Um, that said, every single person, piece of furniture I've ever made and just about everything in the magazine is derived from designs that have come before it. You mentioned Chris Bexford and it's sort of like, well, if it's in the Shaker style, uh, you know, how copyrightable is a little three leg candle stand, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But the, if it's his, his wall lamp, I mean, if you, I think the, I, I, I agree with Mike, there are some period pieces that are just, you know, straight up reproductions, you know? And, yeah. and that is, that is kind of a strange line. I, I think if the way I look at it, if someone sees something in our pages, so if it's like a, a cabinet that Mike made, um, and they love the design, even though it may have roots in arts and crafts. Um, they're still looking at Mike's piece and saying, oh, I'm going to build this basically 
to spec as to what he's presenting. So I'm going to turn around and sell that as a an item in my store. That's that's not really an ethical thing to do in in my view. Yeah, I think um, you know I think there's a lot of room for inspiration and interpretation, and I think trying to reinvent the wheel and start from scratch. It, it's not reasonable, and I don't think it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, even to the point of, oh, okay, I have two pieces of wood. I have to think of a way to join them together. It's like, no, you're probably starting with basic joinery that's been around um, design-wise. Um, you know, like a Garrett Hack piece that's in the magazine. On one hand, I wouldn't knock it off 100% and say, this is my own. However, using that as a jumping off point for designing a piece, I think it's really, really smart because Garrett, that table is based on Garrett's 30 or 40 years of knowledge um, and attempts at designing furniture. So you're starting off with something that is really far along to being really, really good. And I think if that's your starting point, um, more power to you. I think for me, it's like, are you taking a technique or, or a piece of design and kind of calling it your own or are you sort of internalizing that and then coming up with your own work as similar as it may look does it have have you are you introducing your own viewpoint yeah, yeah. to it I think that's that's really important yeah I think you know one of the one of the main tenets of what we do is to inspire people and so I think looking at a piece of furniture and saying oh I want to make that and or I see something in there that I want to incorporate into yeah. something I'm making that's similar. That's a little bit different. What I'm thinking is, you know, taking a plan verbatim from the magazine or yeah. from our store bought plans and building it and then selling that exact piece as kind of your own. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say don't do that. But at the same time, you know, we all got to start from somewhere. Right. Um, and again, every single piece of my work is you, well, you could trace of the lineage back to other pieces. Right. So. And that's why we, the, one of the things we, you know, we will often, I think the policy is basically to tell people to call the maker yeah, yeah. and say, Hey, this is what I'm planning yeah. to do. And, you know, they may say, Oh, you can't, or they may be saying, you know, fine. Right. You know, I put it out there. Well, let's, I mean, let's, let's use uh Heide Martin serving trays, for example. That is something that I could see somebody, making a bunch of and going to a craft show and selling them mm -hmm. and Haida being at that craft show. Yeah. Um, I guess, is it the exact same thing? Then that's not uh, yeah. a good thing. No. Yeah. No. So I, it's, there's no one answer here. No, no. It, I think it, you, it depends on the circumstance. If you're, yeah. if you're trying to be, you know, I, to me, it's, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, maybe a lawyer would be different, and <clears throat> I don't really like to read legal documents. Yeah. I've had enough of that. But um, I think in terms of it's more of an eth ethical question for yourself. Um, what are you doing? Are you taking someone's design and, and profiting off, off of, their, of their hard work? Yeah, and, and selling I, it as I your mean, own? a mom and pop shop versus um, – my, you know, my wife's a fiber artist and, and she hears stories of, uh, it's more in like t-shirts and embroidery mm -hmm. and things like that, where it's a lot easier to rip off 100% of the intellectual property. Yeah. Um, you, you know, somebody making a shirt and selling it and see, you know, six months later seeing that shirt in target. Right. Right. I mean, this is, this yeah. is. Yeah, it's it's further down the same road. It's a certain lifespan. Right. Yeah, even, like in like they say when New York fashion like shows up in New Jersey across the river, it's done. Yeah. Oh, you know? Wilbur, yeah. you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't make that up. Well, um, even with with period pieces, I mean, if you if you go to a class like you know Bob Van Dyke's uh, at the Connecticut Valley, where you're building a straight reproduction, it it, it will say the name, you know, Chippendale, yeah, yeah, whatever. And so I think, I don't know, I'm trying to think of what... The, I've seen many people sell things. Um, oh, David yeah. David Picciuto, yeah. um, a lot, and he, he tells people, hey, if you want to go make money with this, go yeah. right ahead. And, and I think I've been at a craft show, and they say, you know, 
uh, Pachuto s- serving trays or whatever, mm. you know, and that, like that's a right. great way of doing it. He, but he has also given you and everyone else the the right to do that. What, so. what cool. kind of sticks in my cross sometimes is when th- there there are some places where they teach a class like um, there's a, a, a school that offers classes and basically it's the Sam Maloof rocking chair. You know, there's no yeah. doubt about what it is. But nowhere in the literature does it say Sam Maloof. Yeah. You know, right. they call it a mid century rocker. And to me, yeah. that's being a bit disingenuous, you know. That's tough. We, yeah, because I mean the, the Maloof rocker has become this iconic form yeah. that a lot of people make. So just give the name. And and then I yeah. then I feel better about it. But when you when you take Sam's name out of the whole thing completely, it it sort of yeah. bugs me. I have this idea for like a line of furniture. I'm gonna make a table but put the live edges together with a piece of glass. I'm going to call it the river table. I think I've got something there. <laughs> Playing with fire there. Yeah, right back yeah. I mean, that's a good example of um, this author. He wrote for us. I'm st- mm-hmm. Gosh, what's his name? I forget. Greg? Greg. Was it Classen? Yeah. Greg, yes. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic furniture maker. You know, uh, he's one of the first people I saw where you do, you know, two live edge slabs with the live edges together and he'd route a recess to drop in like a little tinted blue piece of glass. And it's like really, really beautiful. And it involves a certain amount of craftsmanship and technique to make it look good. Um, but I think the real genius there was like the thought to the concept, do it. Yeah. And I mean, and I think that's a, a really huge thing. The problem is, yeah, it's, it's, it's takes a lot um, to be able to concept and make it, but for someone to see it, it's like, Oh, I get it. I can do that. And unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of people. kept yeah. doing that. And Greg is someone who's a professional woodworker, and this is his livelihood. Yeah. Um, and that's really, really tough when other people are sort of filling this need um, with their own work when someone else sort of came up with that idea. But, you know, woodworking is a craft, and it's um, it's kind of... Uh, it, it's a difficult thing. Did Greg go to Cerritos? Was he is he a West Coast guy? I don't think so. No, because uh, the funny thing is, since I first started seeing his work um, in the past few years, when I've gone to the Design and Wood show mm-hmm. in <clears throat> San Diego, that concept, those river tables, yeah. or that you know the the colored epoxy kind of thing, it's there are at least six or seven pieces in sure. every show that are using that technique yeah. in some way. And Greg, he, um, I think he sort of copyrighted the term the river table. And yeah. I think he mistakenly and undeservedly took some flack um, from the internet folks because he wasn't he wasn't saying no one else can do this. His his point was, I'm just you protecting can't. my personal brand. You can't he was, call it. You can't call it. You this. can't yeah. call it the yeah. river table. Yeah. The river table just yeah. means I made it. Yeah. There's a lot of this stuff out there now. If you're interested in where it came from and the fact that I'm making it, then look for that. Yeah. And that's all. And I, I don't, I don't think yeah. I have a problem. I mean, with that. And, and there are, we deal with, you know, a, frankly, a lot of professional furniture makers as authors. And there have been cases in the past where we've seen a project. Um, I know Craig Dipido has had a few where, you know, we love it. We'd like to show either how to do something within it, like some hardware aspect mm-hmm. or whatever, some technique. And and sometimes he'll just say, you know, that's that's mine. I don't want to give that away. Yeah, that's kind of what I do. Yeah, and, right. and so I think people, you know, have to have that in their back of their head. They have to realize that, you know, you're, once it's on paper or in, on video, it's out there. And yeah. people are going to try it. Yeah. Really exciting and cool thing for me is... Um, if I've done a piece in fine woodworking, like for instance, I did a, a wall hanging tool cabinet <clears throat> and every single example I've seen of someone posting pictures of a cabinet based on my sort of rough design is so much better than my cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really cool. It's like, okay, yeah, here's a good starting point. I'm glad it worked for you, but man, it's really neat to see what people are, are doing yeah. with that. And I just taught a, a little bookcase class. A simple bookcase sort of in the style I'd kind of been working in for a while. And one of the students also happens to be going to um, CFC's Center for Furniture Craftsmanship as well, Peter. And so Peter took the bookcase and he later on added 
doors to it, which were sort of half wood panel, half glass panel, to this bookcase. And I saw a picture of it just scrolling through Instagram. And I said, oh, wow, that's a really cool piece. And I thought, wait, that kind of looks like the bookcase. And then I saw it was Peter's work. And he sort of took this idea and sort of took it a step further. And these doors, for some reason, they have a very sort of mid-century Danish modern feel to it. And it completely transformed that that piece and that design into something that, number one, was really cool and really different, but also in a direction that, in my mind, I've been wanting to go anyway. But I didn't think that piece had anything to do with that style. But all of a sudden it did, and it just opened my mind up to... Like just yeah, just moving forward from there. So. Are you the Beatles or the Beach Boys right now? Uh, <laughs> I was trying to come up with with it's another amazing. reference, <laughs> and, and nothing. Could fit well, it could also it could also go the opposite way too. And I don't want I'm not going to name the um, the author's name, but he had made a piece for us, and uh, a few people had sent in photos that hey, I made so-and-so's piece, check it out. And um, a lot of times they would introduce, you know, the contrast. They would go to the contrast. And I remember I sent uh, some of these photos to the to the guy and he was like, his reply was oof. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just one of those things where, you know, they they took that design, personalized it, but they went in kind of a, a wrong direction where his contrast was subtle. They took it to the next level. <laughs> they made and it their own. I'm, but I'm they, down uh, with that. You know, yeah. But technique wise, craftsmanship wise, the work was top notch. It was just funny. His reaction to it was like, oof. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, question number four. Let's, and we're going to make this one quick. Um, it's from John. I was reading a fine woodworking article by Steve Lada in issue number 241 about drawboard tenons, where he said, I make pins from riff sawn or quarter sawn stock. If you're making dowels, how can it possibly make any difference whatsoever if you use quarter sawn or plain sawn boards? That almost sounds I like... I still like Steve Lotta, by the way. Keep up the great work. See you at Fine Water King Live. And we're going to point you out to Steve Lotta now. It, the, the, it almost sounds like Steve's John? line almost sounds like something out of a like a, an April Fool's joke, but I started thinking about this I, no, question. It's, I, was I, like, I make pins from riff sawn or quarter sawn stock that's if really possible funny. with straight grain on both faces, cutting them a quarter inch square and four or five wow. inches long. See, that's why Steve Lott is Steve Lott and I'm just Yahoo in his basement. Cause when I, when I'm, You're in Steve Lott's basement? I'm, no, in my basement. <laughs> I don't know if Steve has a basement, but when I'm banging out dovetails, I'm not necessarily looking at the grain. You know what I mean? It's funny. I'm just... Or drawboard, or pens, dowels. Yeah, dowels. Yeah. yeah. What did I well, say? Well, but he's right, though. Um, yes, I mean, by the time it's round, there is no face. Yeah. But in terms of the stock, um, if you're working with a board that's quarter sawn and the really tight grain lines on the face of the board make it a little bit easier to see which way the grain is going than if you just have cathedrals or something. Um, and then also when you're splitting out wood, I think Steve saws it, but a lot of times I'll do it um, with my little hatchet. Um, I'll get a piece of stock, which is as straight as I can find, and then rather than sawing off the edge, I'll take my hatchet and give it a smack so it splits exactly on the grain line. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of riven, but then I'll, I'll joint that and then I'll saw off of that so the grain is as straight as possible. So, um, And with wood wanting to split... Um, Easier in that quarter sawn along that quarter sawn face. No, that doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm trying to think. I so, mean, so you're starting with stock. For me, it's I think it's easier to see how yeah, straight it is. Yeah, but, yeah. but you're right. You're 100 percent right. Yeah, by the time you turn it around, there ain't no quarter sawn uh, I have, on face. I, I have <clears throat> perfectly selected riff sawn stock, and then made it round. Yeah, and thought. Why did I go through all of that effort? Yeah. But it's easier to see straight grain and yeah. riffs on four quarters on stock. Yeah, you've got straight grain on all four faces of riffs on stock, so it's even easier to make yeah. sure you're you're straight. So Yeah. Yeah. Good good point. Um I think the the important thing Just is watch to make sure Steve. it's it's uh, super, super straight in yeah. in both faces. Yeah, it's funny with the with the the handmade dowels I've made in the past, sometimes they get a little wonky on the other end when they're coming out the uh, the hole. But 
All right, we've got some comments on YouTube on STL186. Tim Holiner, uh, he has a nice little humble brag here. I love the comment about the bandsaw, and we we're talking about placing the spline or the spines up against something. Um, I immediately went down to my shop and put my band saws 19 inches and 14 inches yeah. back to back and got a big increase in space. Living the dream there, Tim. Two band saws. That is That's the dream. Nice. Um, on the website, Sharper802 corrected me. The blue tape and super glue idea was on Crimson Guitars' YouTube channel four years ago, not Stu Mac. And uh, I've been on a Bender of Crimson Guitars YouTube channel, so I can't believe I didn't come back, come across that again. Um, let's see. On iTunes, we had a couple of five star reviews. One is from Mark O. Thomas. I, the, iTunes names are the worst. Mark Double Ot Thomas. Yeah, Double Ot Thomas. I just finished some heavy audio books while working in the shop. This show is a welcome relief. I want to know what he was listening to. That was that. That awful, mm. so that heavy. All right, and then from Maverick two two nine. Most days I end up working long hours in the shop alone. For the last week, I just let this podcast play on the Bluetooth speaker. I'm catching up on past episodes, but it's kept me company much more than music alone. I've enjoyed my days more now than than what that I spend it shaking my head, rolling my eyes, and routinely chuckling. Thanks for keeping us entertained. Uh, we're happy to be there in the shop with you, Mar Maverick. Cool. Maverick. And you, Mark, as well. All right. Anybody have any recommendations? Uh, the Masters, as in the golf tournament, um, they posted on YouTube the final round of each Masters tournament. I don't think it's going back maybe 18 or 20 years, at least 20, because I was like rewatching Tiger Woods win wow. in 97 and 2001. So that was cool. I'm going to counter that with the revisionist history episode on golf and why it's the worst thing ever. Why golf is the worst thing ever? Yeah. Is that from like I'll post a, a link? Okay. It's a podcast, yeah. Okay. It's a, I can't remember the guy's name. From like a, a cultural, political perspective or just from yeah. an enjoyment perspective? From cultural, political perspective. And it's really based on like golf courses in LA. Huh. Like, I think it doesn't necessarily apply to golf courses in Connecticut as much. All right. Very interesting. Malcolm Gladwell. That's his name. My recommendation? Yeah. Take, take a day off. All right. <laughs> I took Wednesday off. It was great. All right. That's all for this episode of Shop Talk Live. If you have any questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them in to shoptalkattalk.com. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening. We'll see everyone at Fine Woodworking Live. You know that that Beavis and Butthead started off as like one of those MTV short yeah, cartoons. Yeah, they, they were like that uh, and Dario. They frog. They used to play frog baseball. Ooh. Simpsons started out as shorts too on yeah. the Tracy Ullman show. Oh yeah, that's right. And so did uh, Napoleon Dynamite. That was an MTV short. What? What? Yeah. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Fun trivia. Hey. <laughs>